first impression of the potteries was the view one gets from the train going from Derby to Crewe, which was that it was the most revolting industrial wilderness I'd ever passed through in my life. That's how people still think of the potteries, a backwater concentrating on the industry that gave it its name. But today there's a feeling in the potteries that things are going to be different, that already things are changing here. The six towns of Tunstall, Burslem, Hanley, Stoke, Fenton and Longton that fused long ago into the straggling city of Stoke-on-Trent, the six towns have always been a little world on their own. When you come into the potteries from the outside, it's as if they were surrounded by water, they're so insular. This little island used to be linked to the rest of the world by the twin lines of the Potteries Loop, built in the heyday of the railways nearly a hundred years ago. Here at Etruria it begins, turning its back on the Manchester-London line, to run past Josiah Wedgwood's first factory, before looping and twisting through the northern towns. Apart from parcels and the occasional goods train, the loop is closed now. The roads have taken over, and the importance of the old line is recalled only by the older generation of railwaymen. In its heyday, there were trains scheduled every 20 minutes over the loop line between Etruria and Kidsgrove Liverpool Road Halt. Interspersed with that were freight trains and the whole thing, of course, had to work to a very tight schedule to keep it going. The goods yards, too, are closed. Freight traffic is now centralised at a new depot. Soon the sidings at Hanley will be torn up. Uh, that siding over there is the passenger loading dock, where, in the past, most of the theatrical equipment for the Theatre Royal was loaded and unloaded each weekend. We're playing two games on the pink quirky ticket. The first game will be only two lines across the con, following on for the full out. Not Ladybug. Eyes down, look in, and your first number out is under the end, 31. Three and one, 31. Under the B13, 1-3, 13. Under the end, 39. Three and nine, 39. Under the B, number two. On its own, number two. Under the I, 18. One and eight, 18. The amusements of the 20th century have broken into the potteries these past five years. People here seem intent on making up for lost time, packing into the present what it's taken others ten years to get used to. In one way, the potteries have led the rest of the country, with slum clearance and housing. They needed to, for they must be the most striking example of the unplanned industry that grew up in Victoria's time. No one can seriously regret the passing of the old squalor and ugliness, but there is a nostalgia among potteries folk for the coziness of the old terraces, huddled close to one another and to the pot bank, so that you could almost step out of bed to the workbench. By comparison, the new estates seem clinical and sterile. There's not nowhere you can go. I mean, the lads, mostly lads, they hang around the shops nearly every night. We don't want to move. I could live in any of the suburbs. My salary's such that I could afford it. But I don't want it. I want the folk that I live with, the folk, North Staffordshire folk, still content people that are, are nice to know. Whether Pottery's folk are entirely happy about it or not, the world is beating a path to their door. Forty years ago, iron and steel broke the old monopoly of pits and pots. Now it's expanding and modernising. 
Coal, too, has a streamlined new look which hints at the enormous changes underground. A special conveyor belt system delivers coal across the valley direct to the new steel rolling mill that cost 18 and a half million. There's a new look in the streets of the six towns, too. For years, they've each preserved their independence despite federation. Now they're discovering a real centre of gravity in Hanley. The big shops have moved in and more are building. A new civic centre is growing up. The old image of dirt and smoke is going. Twenty years, thirty years ago, there was nothing to only ruddy smoke. And when there's plenty of smoke, there's plenty of money. When it was clean, no smoke, there's nobody working. But now, they've got the gas and the electric open, so you don't get any smoke. So it's a hell of a sight cleaner now than where it was twenty years ago. The traditional Wakes Week, that used to turn the place into a ghost town once a year, even that's not what it used to be. Next year it may disappear forever. Already Blackpool has ceased to be the sole holiday attraction. This year more Potteries people went abroad than ever before. Not just young people, but parents and grandparents, who suddenly felt the urge to look at the world outside, and realised somewhat to their surprise that they had the money to do it. Changes have been creeping in since the war, but in the past few years they've speeded up, and of course there are casualties. The Swan Pottery at Tunstall may find itself a victim of the motor car age, threatened with demolition to make way for a traffic roundabout. It's a typical old-style pot bank, Ramshackle almost makeshift to look at, but paying its way all the same, largely by supplying schools and colleges with red clay for their pottery classes. About its only concession to modern methods is an electric kiln. It's the kind of place where a former employee drops in as though she's popped round to a neighbour's kitchen to show off her new baby. The owner, Richard Webster, feels that he and his workers have a right to survive. Well, if the scheme went through as uh, asked by the corporation it would virtually close our factory down. We have suggested that they reduce their roundabout by 20 feet, which would leave us sufficient room and buildings to carry on as we have been doing. And uh, I don't think that 20 feet would make that much difference to the uh, road scheme as a whole. I think there is a, a place for a small family business in the pottery industry. Uh, we can't compete with uh, mass production methods, but we do cater for individual items which um, the bigger people don't bother with. But we have on here a number of people who have worked here the whole of their working lives and their fathers before them, and uh, they would find it very difficult to adapt themselves to anywhere else, uh, even if they could be taken on, some of them being, the man in particular, being old. Well, there's less regimentation in a, a small firm, and, and it is like one big family. Everybody is happy, and uh, as long as we get the work out by the end of the week, we don't regiment them in any way. It's all a million miles from the world of union disputes and strikes and personnel officers. Well, you know, I shall retire, I think, so that if it closes down. Well, I don't think it seems fair, really. Because uh, there's nothing to do with the man, he doesn't bother at all with that stuff. As long as he does work, it's a very comfortable one. It suited me. He says he's living at all. Oh, I mean, a man at his age, he can't go to get another job. No, do a lot of us out of work and all that. Because it's been up such a long while. No, I think it's a real pity, although I think it's a necessity. But I'd like to see it come down just the same. Even the bigger, more modern pot banks retain an atmosphere that seems almost quaint. 
Many are still private concerns, like the one run by the Plant family in Longton. One of the directors is Mr John Plant. Well, I'm a fifth generation of the plants. Uh, it started by great-great-great-grandfather Benjamin Plant in 1775. He started potting in Longton then, and this was carried on by his son and his grandson, uh, my grandfather, who brought the factory here about 1890, and since then we've gone on and built the factory up to the present size. Uh, family tradition is very strong. I think the, um, the work people on this factory uh, like the family feeling of the business, and we've got uh, two and three generations of work people working here. Uh, people generally appreciate being a personality and not a number, and the fact that they're known by their Christian names, and if they have any grievance, they can come right to the top. Even the bosses are known by their Christian names, but with a respectful Mr. added. Will you keep an eye on Yes, Mr. John, I'll see to them. On the factory floor, there's still a real pride in the job and a sense of belonging. Well, I've had a job with more money, but I'll get it up to come back here. I mean, uh, you can go for these better paid jobs, but uh, there's nothing killing them when you... I mean, you can get the money, but uh, there's no friendliness in the shops. I mean, they cut your throat for a penny, some of them. If you're out of work and down and out here, you have people all help you, but if you're away from them, you're in a strange country and you know no one to help, nothing else. Well, when I look around you and see this, and I know it sells all over these cells, but it keeps about 200 people working. It does give them a satisfaction, doesn't it? I mean, you've been the creator. As soon as you see it in the shop, when it's in Dolben, it's a talk here, and they know that's mine. I mean, it, at first, pottery firms were reluctant to pioneer new shapes, but this one's now doing well on the design side. Nowadays, uh, uh, things uh, have started happening in the uh, industry, and uh, a sort of reawakening, which uh, showed itself particularly at the trade fair at Blackpool last year, gave definite signs that the pottery industry was beginning to wake up and see that there was something in good design um, which would create a market and sell. Uh, in um, Canada and the States, um, of course we export somewhere about 50% of our merchandise. In Canada, uh, we sell a fair amount of dinnerware, uh, but very largely the sale is in a rather peculiar trade in what we call cups and saucers and they take rather garish um, uh, hodgepodges of gold and color and roses and all sorts of sprays and things um, and they sell them by the raft and uh, these things all disappear into people's homes and they never get used they get stuck into uh, china cabinets and they're a little piece from back home or something like that. Um, our managing director went over to Canada and took the new shape with him and, and had success that we didn't think would be possible because they're rather inclined to say, well, we come to uh, England for traditional stuff and we go to the continent um, and Germany for uh, modern design or Scandinavia. And we had uh, Scandinavian design pushed down our throats to a certain extent over the past few years and we export to Scandinavia, the good old traditional English blueprints and um, highly decorative things, just the things that one would never associate with uh, um, the, uh, the pristine clinical Scandinavian taste and design. The pot banks can't rely as they used to on a steady intake of school leavers. Young people see things differently today. I've noticed that an awful lot of the parents who have got their children jobs in the pottery industry are quite content to find them semi-skilled, almost dead-end jobs and quite happy to leave them there. Well, I disagree with Malcolm entirely. You only have to look around you. You only have to look at the buildings that are going down, the slum clearance areas. 
the new buildings that are going up, being a teacher, if I may say so, I would say that parents are much more interested in their child having a far better education than they ever had. I think he's got a very distorted picture of Stoke-on-Trent all the way. The important things are the basic things of the city, the youth which we represent. That isn't moving up and down like bingo or bowling. It's still only to look at the city to see that we've got about 30 or 40 very active youth clubs. The very fact that we have a theatre in the round which has been doing exceptionally well these last this last 12 months or so. It is that the average attendance of the theatre in the round for a theatre which seats 380 is being 35. You can hardly call this a very good attendance. We've been having excellent write-ups in, in the papers and I'm told that the BBC are going to film um, one of their plays, The Jolly Potters. Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> People's roots go deep here. Behind the grim and sooty facade of the potteries and the matter-of-fact nature of the people, there's a sense of a community with its own values, an intense love of music which can lead to passionate disputes over the style of the organ music. Pottery's people can always be relied on to fill the Victoria Hall Hanley for a concert by a visiting orchestra. They have a love of flowers too and parks fiercely cultivated. A feeling for bright paint in the countryside just beyond the spoil heaps. And out on the allotments a keen delight in pigeon racing. It's a highly organised sport followed with intense seriousness. It can draw a whole neighbourhood from their houses to watch their preparations for a big race. There's money at stake too, often hundreds of pounds. Ten seconds to go. Oh. Then comes the wait in the evening light for the birds to come winging home over the terraces and chapels. Beneath the sooty surface, there's always this humanity and beauty. It's the same with their religion, mainly Methodist, presenting an ugly and forbidding front to the world, as if ashamed to admit the emotions that are its lifeblood, that are revealed in their music. For if there's one thing the Potteries people excel at, besides making China, it's singing. There's a full-throated joy in a Potteries choir singing a Potteries hymn about the beauty of nature.
These days, the churches and chapels have plenty of competition. They always did have some from the pubs at every street corner, but few of these pubs today can keep up with the new clubs, which for a two-shilling membership offer cheap drinks, dancing, and a bar open till midnight. Church, church messing, bun and a coffee, tuppence for go in and, you know, anybody get up and do a song in one mass or another till they say was coming along after. Well, that was our enjoyment when I was a lot about 18. For the younger generation, there are smart new nightclubs. devised a new dance here, a variation on the twist. It could be Manchester, it could be London, it could be Paris, Rome, Stockholm, but it is Stoke-on-Trent. Beneath the new fashions and the changes, the young people are as solid as ever their fathers were. Life in the potteries still has a flavour all of its own. There'll never be another place quite like it, no matter what they do to change it.